Okay. Um, so, this evening I'm going to give you guys a talk that I'm calling Elemental Ecology. And it's a collection of the practices and approach that I think is most fundamental to actually doing this on the landscape. And so what I like to call it is intuitive manifestation with nature. So really a process of acting and reacting and observing and then making changes based on what you find and what you learn. And so how I got here as a kid, for whatever reason, I really started thinking a lot about perception and truths and really came to the conclusion that humans never really hold the truth. They hold their own version of the truth. And our perception is our reality. Who am I to say my reality is any more true than someone in a straight jacket who doesn't even believe they're in a straight jacket? So perception is reality. And I came to nature as the unifying truth, the thing that actually connects all of us and that at the end of the day determines whether we live or whether we die or what happens, what proliferates. So really from that point forward, I don't know, when I was nine or 10 years old, I really took everything that humans said with a grain of salt and looked to nature as the fundamental guiding source. Um, and so take everything I'm saying in this talk with a grain of salt, you know, use what you can from it. And it's an approach, a pathway. It's not a set thing. It's one approach. And so adapt the parts that you can to what's going to actually work for you. And so... This is Sangrada Familia. I just have it. It's uh, Gaudi's Master Temple, which is this grand undertaking that they hope to complete on the 100 year anniversary of his death. Um, so he never saw most of it complete, and it's still very much a work in progr progress, but it's a very artful thing, one of the most artful temples or cathedrals I've ever seen. And so I have this to remind me to talk about how this is really a unique approach. I hear permaculture called a design science a lot. And if permaculture is a design science, what I see Zep doing and what I try and embody is more of an awareness art. You're trying to become aware of the landscape and the different resources that are available and then how to artistically combine those elements to something that's going to be, it's going to enhance the goals that you're trying to achieve with the project. This is the, so it's the eastern and the western side of the temple. And this I have to remind me to talk about, I was, I met a new friend who's a quantum physicist who works on the particle accelerator. And he said one thing that just resonated so strongly with me and is so true of this work as well. And I think it's important to just recognize that a lot of the base physics that everything that we know is based off of doesn't actually hold true. Matter is not just a particle, but it's also a wave. It can be instant instantaneously disappearing and reappearing and all these different things. So we really, even our fundamental understanding of the way the world works really comes into question when you really look at it with a fine lens. And so what he said about his work is you cannot predict it. You cannot put your effort into a single direction. And I think that exactly sums up working with nature as well. You can't predict what's going to happen. You can't predict what plants are going to do really well. I hate the idea of a permaculture master site plan because to think that you're going to lay out the next 10, 20 years of how the ecosystem is going to adapt is insane. It's never going to work out that way. Uh, and so it's it's more important, much like they're doing at the Krematerhof. You know, they're not just growing cherries. They're not just growing mushrooms. They're growing both of them. So that they're not putting all their effort into one thing. They don't know what's going to happen in any given year. So they're putting their effort into a lot of different directions so that they're more flexible and can change based on their needs. And so the measure of success for me with my work is does the ecosystem thrive beyond human inputs or care? And so when I come onto a property, that's the ultimate thing I'm trying to do is to meet the client's goals in a way that is still going to be a benefit if you take humans entirely out of the equation. Because now you're interacting with those ecosystems and you're not just gaining from your indep independent inputs. Things are happening outside of that that you can then learn to harvest and gain the results from. And so, you know, it's important to be forever learning in the book of nature don't, you know, I don't give any credence to anything that doesn't exist out or that, yeah, that doesn't exist outside of words. So if it's just in theories and words and there's nothing concrete on the ground, 
I really, you know, it's important to absorb information, but it's so much harder to relearn than to learn the first time. And so don't let yourself be crippled by what you learned the first time because it's not necessarily accurate. And so the foundations of this, I'm going to touch on, uh, you know, the, the foundations of this approach, the elements that you're working with, how to cultivate your relationship with nature, how to develop your mind, and how to manifest your world. And we're going to go through these pieces fairly quickly, then we'll summarize again at the end, and in between I'll have more of a project show and tell that we can go more into techniques and things like that. So the foundation that this is all based off of, nature is truth. I didn't choose perfect because that's anthropomorphizing it, but nature is reality. That's the world we're working with. If you want to find out what's true or not, go test it in nature and it'll, it'll tell you pretty clearly. Water is life. 70% of all water is, or 70% of all life is water. And so that's really the fundamental, most important element in any farm or homesteading enterprise. Interconnectedness is positively correlated with productivity. I spent four years studying ecology in university, and this was the one real important piece I got out of it. But basically, the more connections in between an ecosystem, the more net productive it's going to be at the end of the day. So you want to really try and start establishing systems that are going to develop connections beyond what you're doing so that it's going to start to grow and increase productivity outside of any of your actions or inputs. And fear is the worst companion in life. Really learning how to control, conquer, and just get rid of fear from your life is going to enable you to do so much. Fear of failure, fear of so many different things. We're such a fear-driven society, but you do have very good control over your mind space. That's the one thing you really have control over. And your brain works in neural networks. So as you start to fire certain neural networks, they get stronger and stronger. And, you know, once you do it for a week, it starts becoming a habit. Once you do it for a month, it starts to get hardwired. And it becomes easier to do that thing that you've built the neural network for than to not. And so this is something that I've gotten pretty good at, where if I ever feel fear, I just snap it out of my brain and once you really are diligent as far as controlling your own headspace and doing that it's actually quite simple and easy to do um, so i would encourage all of you to practice that so the elements that we're looking at you know sun is the energy that we're working with really capturing and storing that element is going to be critical the earth is the body that we're working with and water is the blood water is the blood of the earth and so I really like to use that analogy to start to look at how water is engaging in the earth. You know, the earth's crust is a living, incredible thing that without that water is very rapidly dying, desertifying thing. And so, uh, you know, going back to what we were talking earlier with rainwater catchment, yeah, that's great, but if you have a rain tank, that's not interacting with any other elements. You're not getting any additional benefits from that. If you can store that water in the body of the earth, you're not just going to have the water, but you're going to have all the life that comes with it. You're going to have all the unintended consequences of enhancing the vitality of the space. And so developing your relationship with nature. For me, one of the most important things in doing this is a traditional Native American practice called a sit spot. You know, some people call it meditation, some people call it prayer, all these different things. But it's been very important for me for building all three of these elements. And so it's a very simple practice. You basically go out into a natural area and you sit there until your mind's quiet. First time you do this, it might take hours, it might take days, it might take weeks, it might take years if you really are a city person who's trapped into the modern mentality. But as you get there, you start to be able to get there sooner and sooner. And the easiest way to describe it is if you imagine a body of water. If there's waves and ripples all over the body of water, it's very hard to see anything. But once it all is still and quiet, you can really start to see what's happening. And so you're trying to do that same thing with your mind. You're trying to take all the thought out of your mind so that you can really start to receive the intuition and the knowledge that's all around you. And that's when you can really receive true insight, I believe. So awareness is a really important part of that. They talk a lot in tracking and in wilderness awareness about splatter vision. So your vision is broken into 
two parts, one that's more active movement based and one that's more focused. And we're very dialed in with the focused vision, but what they call splatter vision, you know, you can see movement this far out. And so if you start to not just focus on the exact thing you're looking at, but look at everything all around, and you're trying to do this with not just vision, but you're trying to do this with sound, with feeling, uh, open yourself up to more than just what you're immediately focusing on, but everything around you. And that's when a lot of these connections in the natural systems are gonna start to present themselves to you. Empathy, putting yourself in the shoes of whatever you're trying to understand, whether that's the earth, whether that's the tree, whether that's an animal, really try and become empathetic towards it and really feel what it's feeling. And then you're going to have a much easier time designing synergistic relationships with that. The other one is an attitude of symbiosis. So it's so easy to get tied into the negative mentality, to be walking on your farm thinking, oh, that needs to be done and this needs to be done. And now you're putting time and energy in manifesting those negative things. Now, if instead you focus on the positive connections that you're seeing every day and start to put your time and energy into those, you're going to have a much better quality of life, but also your forward momentum is going to be so much better. So say you have tomato plants and there's an aphid outbreak and the aphids are all over. You can really focus in and hammer in on those aphids and just be focused on that one element and say, okay, I need to spray this or I need to do this or, and try and get rid of them. And they're always going to come back because they're part of the ecosystem. But if you instead look for the positive correlations and say, oh, hey, those hoverfly larvae are just destroying the aphids. Maybe I should enhance habitat for those hoverflies and now you're doing something creative and positive. You're creating habitat for a creature that you like, but it's also solving your problem. And so you're starting to draw that positivity and those positive connections to the farm. Developing your mind. Theory cripples. Appreciate the unknown. I think that's really important. You want to take in and absorb information, but take it with a grain of salt. And really, you don't have to understand nature to be able to work with it. Before working with SEP, I worked with a guy who has this beautiful ecosystem greenhouse that he's been operating for almost 40 years, growing figs and pineapple guava in Montana with tree frogs, no heat, no fossil fuels, no electricity, no outside inputs whatsoever. He has this concept of perpetual soils, cycling the nutrients through the greenhouse ecology each year. He started it as an experiment. He thought it would fail in like five years, but it just seems to get better with time. Now, the most interesting part for me is that he didn't understand what an ecosystem was until I explained it to him. He had created this beautiful interconnected ecosystem and didn't even have a concept for it. He just was working with nature and for him, nature was God. And so he looked to nature for all the answers. And so you really don't have to understand things to work with them in a positive way. Forethink, dynamic and adaptive, thinking ahead. Letting time and nature work to your advantage. Look at the different resources and the actions that are happening and then look at how to capitalize on those. It's a really important part, something that we clearly don't do in modern society. Otherwise, we wouldn't do a lot of the environmental degradation we do do because if you looked, you know, you always want to let time and nature work to your advantage. If you're trying to work against them, you're pushing a huge ball uphill that you're never going to win. But instead, if you're pushing that ball downhill, it just starts to, everything feeds into itself and you get a positive feedback loop. And landscape literacy is a really important part. We touched a little bit on that this morning, but really envisioning the landscape, not just as it is now, but starting to see how it used to be. Looking at where roads were built. An easy thing to do, because we're driving on roads all the time. If you see a road next to a river or a creek or any other body of water, really look at that. And nine times out of 10, that creek or river has been dredged or straightened, or it's had riprap put along the sides. It's basically that a lot of times the easiest roads in and out of places are in the floodplains, but once you have a road there, you don't want the river to flood the banks anymore. So you modify the river to go deeper, further degrading the watershed, further degrading the hydrology, and you can really start to see all these connections when you start to look at them and say, okay, well, you know, a hundred years ago, because I can see the shape of the land that's here and here, this river used to flood these banks and deposit sediment, and there used to be trees all along here, and now it's a road and a straightened river. Uh, so really 
especially as you drive around, it's really easy when you start piecing together, you can see the different impacts that humans have made. Manifesting your world. You know, we create what we want to in the world. We create our own perception. Civil courage is a really important piece. This is a piece that SEP really has nailed. But I think you need to do what's right for yourself and for your landscape and for your nature, regardless of what the laws are. And if the laws are bad, you should break them. And you should stand up and fight that battle in court. And if we don't have people passionately advocating for their nature, for their land, for the other beings of this planet, we're going to be run amok really soon. Uh, and so that's a really important part. Freedom from attachment is a key part of manifestation as well. If you try and find in, hone in too tight on what you're trying to do, you're going to miss the actual thing you manifested. So an example of this, I was doing this work with ecosystem greenhouses, had a really well-functioning company, I was feeling fulfilled, I thought I was doing great. If I had just really focused in on that, I would have missed this whole other thing that I believe to really be my life's calling and that I believe is what I was actually manifesting. The greenhouses were just a step along the way. But if I wasn't free from that attachment, if I really got attached and just said, I'm the greenhouse guy, I'm gonna build greenhouses, I would have totally missed the actual thing I was trying to create in the first place. And relentlessness is a really important part. You know, Sep embodies that as well. You have to just, it's an attitude that you're going to make it, you're going to be successful, you're going to do what you need to do. If you have to work 50 times as hard as everyone else, that's what you're going to do. If you have to go through litigation, if you have to go all these through these different things, if you set your mind to it, you are going to be able to do it. So having that just brutish relentlessness, I think, is a really important part of creating what you want to see in the world. And so the world is our canvas. It's a beautiful place. Create beautiful things. I think it's, you know, why not? What better have we got to do? Um, so if there's no questions on that, I'm going to start diving into some different projects where I'll show some more stuff of uh, what we've been talking about throughout today. Good? Okay. Um, so this first one is in Mindo, Ecuador. It's in a place that gets two to three meters of rainfall, so quite a lot of moisture, but they have a six-month dry season. But I was working on a place that was basically degraded cow pasture, and even in this rainforest got bone dry, dusty dry in the summer uh, because of the land degradation. Uh, when you, when you uh, do the, the sit spot, meditate, um, that sort of thing, do you have a protocol? Um, go find a place that calls out to me for whatever reason and then basically just sit there till my mind's quiet and nothing that, you know, I like to be fairly comfortable. Um, but to complete answering your question, it's, you know, I, I, um, so an easy way for me to describe it is the, the mind state that you're holding is going to determine what the nature around you is doing. So for example, one time I was in a sit spot and, uh, you know, I got to the point where my mind was totally quiet and a deer started walking up, you know, it was 10 feet away from me. And the moment I thought, oh man, I can't wait to tell someone about this, the deer just looks at me and then goes starting off, <laughs> which starting is what they do to show an, a predator that they're not injured. They lower their head and they buck up on all fours to basically, and they kind of like prance, and you'll see deer doing this, but it basically shows them, I'm not injured, you're not going to catch me, don't bother. Um, but it, you know, it was totally fine with me until my mentality shifted and it you know, almost felt betrayed, looked at me and ran off. Uh, I've had the same thing happen with all sorts of animals, but so it's, and actually animals are making calls all the time through the woods. And if you really start to read them, some people are amazing. You'll be sitting out at a campfire and they'll say a Cooper's hawk is going to fly over in a minute. A minute later, Cooper's hawk flies over. Because all the different songbirds are letting out calls, telling everyone where everything is. And all the animals pay attention to this. And the ground squirrels do, and all the different animals do. And you can... The same person, I can, with different mentalities, I can walk through and not trigger any alarms. <coughs> or if I'm not being really diligent about my mind space, everyone's telling everyone where I am. And so you're not going to see anything in that case. And so it's, 
the the mind state is so critical it's really hard to explain but i think the easiest place to get there is just going and doing sit spots make it a daily routine make it a weekly routine whatever you can do um, but go to the places that call you try and let your mind really quiet down and then uh, nature is going to show you the rest from that point forward and a lot of times when i started out the easiest thing was to basically just like dive through all of that you know, I would spend a half an hour or an hour just going through all the different things in my mind until it was happy enough, you know, it had thought all of that out, that stuff was done, and so now it could start to actually be quiet. Um, so this project, you know, every project starts with a test slice, looking at what the geology was. This was actually really marginal geology, where at first we'd wanted to create a water, larger water feature, but we ended up shifting to a smaller water feature and some patties and some terraces and focusing on the project as a whole rather than just trying to create a big water feature. It's kind of on this loma, the next bench up from a river, two rivers actually, um, and so you know, there were some layers with some clay in it, not as much as I would have liked, other layers with no clay in it. And so it was a very delicate process of pulling out, sorting, and dealing with all the different materials as they came out. Um, so what did you profile there? Who, what machine did your profile? An excavator. Okay. Yep. Yep. For large projects like that, that seems... Like you well would then do a, a core first? Do. You know, I haven't found a good core that goes as deep as I want. I'm sure they yeah. exist, but I haven't found them. And the the cost of an excavator, if it's somewhere close, is so cheap. Yeah. You know, you're talking a couple hundred dollars to do the test slices for a half day. Um, so usually it's just a lot easier yeah. to, yeah, I like to do it that because way. Because the it's soil can change from here to here, and you did a core right here. And exactly, exactly, yep. <coughs> and then you can really s figure out exactly where you want to be. Ch and then, you know, in a half day, I'll do six different test slices where I really got a good idea of the geology in a bunch of different places. Whereas a lot of the core samplers that I've seen are really for like the top three feet. Mm -hmm. um, and they're quite a lot of work to get three feet deep as well. Uh, and so what I do when I'm doing test slices is have the excavator operator pull out the, so you know, he'll start piling here and as he goes deeper and deeper, he moves down the line. So I can do a hand texture on each of those different layers as they're coming out. And then I put in a tape and say, okay, this layer was this deep and yada, yada. Okay. Um, so this is, I guess this was after a big rain when the pond started filling up. Um, but basically, this is that water feature, you know, we did our test slice in here, this is our dam, and then this is where a lodge is going to be eventually, this is going to be an ecotourism kind of center. Uh, terraces leading back and forth, with some, which some better pictures will show. This is putting in the key of the dam, and so this was actually similar to the other one where we had all this overburden to deal with that I went ahead and threw down the hill and started building up that downhill embankment of the pond um, and then, you know, tied down into our good parent clay material. So isn't that a quite unusual way to do a key for a dam that you've actually left the embankment on one side and you're gonna build it up? Yeah, yeah, it's very unusual and it's yeah. actually obnoxiously so. Um, but in this situation where you know, we had all of this material to strip off before we got to any good clay that we could yep. build the key with. And then also because the material was marginal, we had to actually sort it with the excavator as it was coming out. And so it was, it was a lot of dealing with material before we could even start laying the key. And so that's how we ended up with this. And you know, you can imagine this joint in between your key and your downhill mm -hmm. embankment so is a pain to deal with. Sorry, what's that? What do you mean by the key? The, so the key barrier layer, the core. clay oh, okay. core of the dam. <laughs> so all of this material is permeable. Water okay. would go straight down through that. This is the clay that we've sorted out and are using. And then this is basically digging down to that barrier clay layer, at which point we're packing in the good material and then rolling it with the rolling compactor. Did that's, I can tell it's very deep. Did you have to import clay from anywhere? Were you able to get it? all from this from that area right we were there. able to get uh, we had to pull a little bit 
in from around the corner, like over here in this picture, okay. there was a good clay area that we ended up, you'll see it, but we ended up making this big wide terrace out of basically what we used as a clay mine. We didn't need a lot, but we needed, I don't know, 20 yards from there, 30 yards, oh, 50 yards, much. something like that. Yeah. Um, so we were able to get it from just right around the corner. And for the most part, we were working with the material that came out of the hole. And why did you take Lada radar also with you? No, that's a different guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's both. Yep. <laughs> He's very good at this kind of work, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, and so this gives you more of a view from up above. You know, you can see that actually got quite large because we're dealing with so much overburden. And this was the area where we were sorting that. So that process of sorting the clay is basically pulling the material up and shaking it into a big pile. And what you have happen is all the bigger particles and sediment go more to the sides and you concentrate the clays and the fines in the middle of that. Sometimes you have to do it several times. Um, sometimes once is enough. It really depends on the material you're working with. And then you're, there isn't a pile here to show, but you're stripping off the bad stuff from around and then maybe even doing it again until you get the clay concentration that you're looking for. 40% plus. What, what's the definition of overburden? Overburden is material that's in the way of getting to what you want to. So for example, a mine, overburden is everything on top of the material you're mining. Um, in this kind of situation, the overburden is all the stuff that wasn't clay that we needed to get out of the way to get to the clay. Mm -hmm. uh, this is putting the crown on the dam. Um, you know, it is important that the dam has a nice crown to it. You don't want water sitting or pooling on the dam at any point uh, because it's going to do that expansion and contraction and cause issues over time. Um, so that's a really important piece to have into the puzzle. So this is a good example of how we were talking before about, I was saying if I ever create a project that looks exactly like my design, I screwed up. So we got all these beautiful big boulders out of here that the test slices did not indicate we were going to be getting. And so we were able to make this really nice natural spa hot zone extension off of the pond where all these boulders are set in at different levels and you can sit in at different levels. You can sit in water this deep or this deep or this deep, wherever you want to be. I would have never built that into the design because we wouldn't have said, okay, we're going to import a couple tons of boulders, but if they're there, it's a really nice creative element to work with. So if your design's not shifting as you're doing it, I don't think you're interacting with the landscape enough as you're creating. This is that process of the monk pipe. Um, so painting the pipe with blitz cement, wrapping it with geotextile, and then painting that. The, uh, sorry, the blitz cement is also called instant hydraulic cement. That's what we call it. It's blitz cement in Austria. Um, and it sets very quickly, you know, like five minutes. So it's actually, that's why we have so many hands on deck to do this, because you really got to get it on the pipe, wrap the geotextile, soak the geotextile in it, otherwise it starts setting up on you too quick. And it's uh, some sort of poly pipe, it's plastic pipe? Yeah, yep, so um, in the States I like to use C900, which is a potable drinking water grade, high pressure pipe. The pipes for the monks, it's very important that they have a <coughs> bell gasket yep. and a long bell gasket. So not like the SDR35 that everyone tries to use, it's cheap crap, has a gasket that's belled like that. This stuff that I'm, uh, well is the only stuff I'll use, has a really long bell gasket. And then it has a little rubber gasket in here. And then what happens is, well, so sometimes, this gasket would actually usually be on the U. In this case, it wasn't, which is why I started drawing it like that, uh, but on the 90. And so what you do, I'm going to redraw this because this is horrible. <laughs> so that you guys really get this um, and what you'd be doing in the States. So you have your dam, you have your pipe, and then you have your nice little dock. And here, you have this belled 90. God, I'm a horrible drawer. Anyway, this is where that rubber gasket is. You rip that one out, just that one. You leave this one in, 
you rip this one out so that it's movable. Yeah. That's why this long gasket is so important. If you try and do that with PVC, forget about it. If you try and do that with STR35, forget about it. It really needs to be that higher grade pipe to be able to do this well. Everyone says, well, so aren't you getting a little bit of leakage here? Yes, you are. And what happens over time is that fills with sediment and basically plugs it up. And it's so little, it's pretty insignificant. Uh, and then you have your standpipe coming up, which is nice because you can adjust it by pivoting it. And then you can also adjust it, if you really want to, by adding or removing sections. Um, it's nice when you find your standing level that you want to have the pipe dead, dead level on top because then you have the water just pouring over the surface and there's basically no way it can really get clogged. Uh, whereas if you have it at an angle, you know, you could start to get stuff coming in there. So I don't, you know, I pitch them at an angle to change the water level. But if you, you know, for example, if you build a monk and you figure out you actually want the water level here, I would just cut that section off to where you want the water level. What? Looks like you're using six inch right there. Um, yep. Is it pretty standard to That's use a good eye. six inch? <laughs> I laid a lot of pipe. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it's depending on your flow rate. Okay. So usually I'm using six or eight inch. Mm -hmm. Usually not much smaller than that. Sometimes in certain situations when that's all available, all that is available. Um, but and sometimes you want much larger than that too. But also really important, if you're talking about just a six or eight in pipe, there's going to absolutely be rain events that overflow that pipe. And so that's where having an overland spillway as well, this is never your only spillway. This is a control valve. Um, and so you can get away with using an eight or a six inch pipe because you have an overland spillway as well. Do you ever um, abrade the pipe to get a better key with your slurry? I actually, I did that in this case. Yeah. Sep doesn't, but I do just because why the heck not? It's easy to just run a grinder over it real quick and you're ready to roll. Are you moving any of the joints? No. Nope. So this rubber you're gasket, I mean, this is really tough stuff. Usually the, the way that I set this is I drive an iron bar into the ground and I, with the excavator, go because it's a lot, it, you know, it takes a lot of work to get these actually together and in as far, that rubber gasket is tight as can be, which even is why, if, lube. yeah, even yeah. with lube, it's tight as can be. That's why if you didn't remove that rubber gasket, even with the leverage, you're not turning that, no way. Um, which is why you actually have to remove that gasket for this monk to work. Well, how tight is it once you remove the gasket? It, that's where the long elbow comes in. So it's, yeah. it's a little bit loose, it, but it's, it's actually it's still not very easy to pivot it. Okay. You can pivot it, definitely, um, but it's not going to fall over on its own. It's tight enough that it's going to stand vertical even without the water or anything like that. And it takes a little bit of force, even with the leverage, still takes a little bit of force to really get it Especially moved. if it builds a little bit of silt. Exactly. Get it pretty and exactly. To, to set them home, you usually take the rock bar, jam it into the ground, good hit yeah. home. And if you can't do that, you don't have space. Maybe you can sit down and give it a good kick home just to, just yeah. to seat it. But yep. it's tight. It's, yeah, exactly. They're and then keeping it clean. Yeah. And if you think this is what they use for municipal water line, yeah. so heavy pressure, lots of flow, you know, this joint, I would imagine, is much stronger than a PVC cemented thing. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not positive of that, but I would guess. Oh, well, it's got some give, so it can't crack. Yeah. And it would allow you a little bit of misalignment to it. Exactly. Then, so you can get a curve and... Yep. Yeah. Could you say again the name of, or spec for the pipe you prefer? So C900. Very expensive, but very worthwhile. Uh, in Austria, they have another one that's the same shape, same wall thickness, but a little bit different plastic composition. That's a little bit cheaper. That comes as a red one instead of a blue one. But you know, you're talking sixty bucks per twenty foot stick of pipe. So and I've actually found this type. I think it's the gray stuff. It could uh -huh. be blue stuff. Uh -huh. It's super. It's the industrial version. Yeah. It comes. I in found it at one. Restore. Ooh. Do you guys have resources? Okay. Yeah. And Habitat for Humanity stores? Yeah. I get so much stuff that would cost hundreds of dollars for 20 bucks. Yeah. Nice. Well, Check yeah. there, and they have six inch all the time. This, it's not, 
in Washington State, it's not used so much anymore. They've gone over to uh, ductile iron, mostly okay. for for water. Okay. But um, I can't tell you how many times I've done a delete on C900, and we've got perfectly good sticks coming out of the ground, uh-huh. and then that just goes to in a big Dunnage pile. Somebody comes along and then takes it to a reuse or okay. uh, yeah, yeah, something yeah. like that. Nice. Yeah. There you go. And it's barely stuff. I mean, it's... It's I, really... Yeah, I I've, put it together in the store, and I can't get it apart without cement. I've, yeah. I've hit it with a with a 320, so a 32-ton yeah. excavator, and, and not busted through yeah. it. Whereas with the PVC or the smaller stuff, just barely touch it, and you're going right through it. The SDR-35, you look at it wrong, and yeah. you're poked yeah. through it. Uh, and if you think, you know... You're digging this trench that's just on the perfect pitch, and you're doing all this work that's taking time and money, and so spending a little bit of extra money on a pipe that, you know, if that pipe cracks and you have to replace all of that, you just spent four times the money you saved on the cheaper pri- pipe. Uh, and so this is, here you can see, this actually is a much different setup than I usually like. This is down in Ecuador, so you know you work with what you can. This is these big, long, you know, they're a one meter tall U. That's their 90s. They don't have anything but that. Usually it's a 90 that's about this big, and then you're adding a standpipe to it, so you can really set your level. Hmm. Whereas this one, we had to be much more diligent because we were basically using the whole 90 as our 90 degree and standpipe. Um, so we just had to set the l- bottom level of the monk just so, so that it worked out how we wanted to. Um, and then this is driving in the post for the dock that was built there. Uh, just a little aside, I love the, there's a Western mentality that's just, if you don't have the tool for the job, you're leaving and going and getting the tool for the job. And that is the, the, Ecuadorian or the third world engineering is just amazing where you make anything work. I've seen people, you know, they don't have a rebar bender. They, it, it doesn't matter what tools they have or not. And so these are these really nice Kyoba posts that were just as good as anything I can produce on a bandsaw mill that were cut with a chainsaw by eye because they go into the woods, they fell their trees, they mill it into what they want, and they carry it out on their backs. So they don't want all the slash wood. They don't want all the branches. The ecologically, it's actually better as far as logging operations go because all of the sugars, all of the nutrients in the sap wood and in all the branches and everything are mostly just staying right where they cut it. You're really just taking out that heartwood, which is a bunch of carbon. And it just was amazing. After I saw that, you know, anyone that buys a chainsaw mill, sorry if any of you guys have them, but it's it just like just up your skill a little bit <laughs> and you know you can do a lot with a little and so i really like that third world mentality um and if anyone really gets into it what they do is they basically use a square cut tooth and they saw they take half of the teeth off of the chainsaw blade so that they're cutting a little bit Have slower than they usually skip, would skip one yeah yeah yeah, yeah. skip yeah. saw exactly yep. um and man they produce beautiful stuff it was incredible. And so this shows you, you know, that big long 90 coming out. You always want to do something in this area around. Usually you're doing s- kind of some collection of rot resistant wood right around the pipe. And then you do a little bit of stonework so that that pipe is not going to silt up and be hard to move over time. It's going to remain flexible and movable. Um, this is that dock a little bit further along the pond. Uh, you know, one of the things we did with these boulders is make a nice little sitting bench so you can sit with your feet in the water right at the <laughs> edge. Um, and so when you start to have, you know, make stuff that's creative, make stuff that's beautiful, make stuff that's eye grabbing. Why not? You have all the resources of nature, you have the time, you have the frickin' power of God with the heavy machinery. Uh, why not do some really creative, beautiful <coughs> things? Uh, some of the joinery. I don't know why this one's so blurry. Um, these are all blurry, whatever. Um, so, you know, here's, so you're always making, you're usually making a dock to service that monk, just like you were saying, Uh, you know, you're not going to wade in the water to do it. And it's really easy. If you have a dock, you just have a stick that you can stick into the end of the monk and pitch to whatever height you want. Um, 
Here you can see, so this is our monk pipe going down into a patty that's down here. And then this is our overland spillway. This is that little hot tub spa area that I was talking about that we made with all the boulders that I would have never built into this project until we had all the boulders. And then we started thinking, you know, what can we do with them? And this is the idea that the clients really liked. And so you can see how, I wish that terraces. drone video was working, but you can see how these terraces zigzag back and forth, meandering all the water through the landscape into a paddy that's here, then coming out, and actually that paddy spills down. There's going to be a site for a lodge there, or sorry, a site for a cabin there, site for a lodge up top, site for like a yoga platform hangout down here. Uh, you know, these terraces open up access. So I really like the terraces because they are doing your water management and they're also opening up access all at the same time for the same amount of earthwork. Um, and then they're giving you these embankments in between that you're usually using for the establishment of perennial crops. So if you need to have annual areas, you have the flat parts of the terraces and your perennials that are going to be your more long-term system are what's establishing and holding together those banks. Uh, and it, I wish I had, I have video, I went down there and visited this spring and it's crazy, just one year later and sugar canes all over and bananas are all over and it's, they've done, uh, they've done a lot of work but they say they've actually done very little <coughs> and it just is so green and lush and beautiful, it's pretty amazing. Um, I don't think I have any of those photos in here but we're, you know, dealing with technological limitations of myself. Uh, so, you know, on those embankments are really where those tree systems are going so that you have those areas in between for access. Um, and this is that paddy above the pond and the spillway coming around down into the pond. Um, and it's, you know, just a beautiful spot. Here's that area I was talking about with all the rocks set at different levels. Uh, you know, this kind of thing would cost way too much to ever do if you had to bring in those rocks. But once you have the resource, it makes it easy to do. Uh, and this is that <coughs> pond, first time it filled up. Um, filled up quick down there. And then, up, oh, oh, uh, this one's all fuzzy too. But basically this is the spillway at the bottom of the system. So I also have this little area that floods when it's really raining so that any remaining sediment, you know, at this point, all the energy and sediments really out of the water, but this is just that one last point before I drop it down. And then where your spillway leads to is really important. This project <coughs> is up on Aloma, so it's a really steep drop down. And as we saw on many of the projects today, if you have that steep drop down, what it's going to do is it's going to start eating away from the bottom of the spillway up, and really start to cause a lot of issues and problems. And so this property is, you know, it's a steep hillside. It's kind of this little loma, steep hillside down to the big river down here. And so we're working up here and we had to at some point drop this water off and down into the abyss, into the river. And it's all steep different channels. So it actually, I did a lot of hunting to find the area that we were going to use as the final spillway, to find a water that the way that the water already was flowing and sheeting off of most of this area, where there was a lot of rock and a really good, well-armored natural spillway already in place down to this river. And so this spillway that you see is just that top little piece up here. Because you're, you know, to try and build a spillway all the way down to the river would have been way too expensive, way too much work and it would have had to be done by hand because the land was too steep in between there. So identifying the best, most natural and safe places to safely discharge that water is a really important consideration. Is that the dam wall there though? Have you built the spillway, spillway down in front of the dam? So this is the dam wall yeah. and then it spills out this way and then it comes down, it spills first off down into a paddy that's oh, okay. up here and then it spills off and down into the corner and then it comes out and along this big long terrace mm -hmm. and then it drops any sediment or energy that it still has here and then it spills off and down 
Okay. This steep area. But is that actually sitting against the damn wall, that area there? That, that um, area of water? Yes, but that it's the dam wall is really wide in that okay. section. Um, it's, you know, this is a pretty low batter, and then it's several meters wide on the top. So down there, it's, Not you know, issue. at the... Yep. you know, 15 meter base of the dam, maybe even more than that, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and this is, you know, it looks like a bigger pool than it is. It's really just like yep. six inches, okay. 12 inches of water, maybe at its deepest. How deep should a sediment pool be? Sediment? Depends on how much sediment you're going to get and how much, how often you want to clean it out. Um, so I like to make them not that deep, but larger, but it, it really depends on your site and your access because sometimes you do want them really deep. Um, that's a tough question to answer because it really depends on how much sediment you might have flowing into it, how often you plan on cleaning it out, and things of that nature. And this is actually that clay mine that I was talking about that we ended up just turning into. There's a beautiful view out into this big lineage tree and the river and all of that. Um, and so this is actually where we were mining the clay that we did need. And then we were able to finish it off into now this area looks beautiful and like it was never touched really. Um, so it's important to, you know, I never want to leave a scar on the land. If you do need to harvest clay from somewhere else, figure out a good way to leave that so that you're not degrading one place to enhance another. Uh, and this is kind of a, an overview of that site. And so you can see a lot of these tagua palms we were able to leave and work around in certain locations. Some we did have to pull out, uh, but for the most part we were able to work around a lot of the trees that they actually wanted to keep. Spring tapping, a really important thing. We all need drinking water. Springs are represent the highest quality drinking water. It's not rainwater that's distilled that doesn't have the minerals we need, and it's not the historic aquifer water that often has too many of certain types of nutrients, and then there's the ecological consequences as well. Spring water is the distilled, fresh, clean rainwater charged and mineralized by the body of the earth presented back out at some point for our usage. Um, so this is a really important thing that, you know, most people used to know, not most people, but a lot of people knew how to do back in the day. And it's really a dying art where it's very, very few people really know how to uh, appropriately case a spring. So in this site, we cased three springs. This is a two inch pipe. Um, we cased three springs for drinking water that were all lower flow. And then we cased this Cabrada Creek for the aquaculture system to get more flow coming through it. Um, so this is actually the casing along that cabrada, uh, sorry, um, what do you call them in English? Uh, like a gully. Um, and so all the water is coming down here. This is actually where a couple of different springs we're feeding into. And this is not a casing for drinking water. So we're able to do it much quicker and dirtier than you would for something like that. And so this is a little clay and rock dam with basically a mump pipe coming out into our pipe leading on there. This very important that it's, you know, it's got a lot of really big rocks. So it's almost like a gabion wall kind of thing because this flows like crazy. And I actually, I was surprised. I didn't expect this to hold up really well. And I was telling him, you know, once the first big flows come through, you're going to have to rebuild it, adjust it. You might even have to add some concrete to make it stable. Um, but we actually were able to build it level enough where it has held up for two different wet seasons at this point without any maintenance on it. Um, and so this was a nice, really just quick couple hour way to tap a water source and be able to use it somewhere. But the more important part is really casing water for drinking, spring tapping. And so what you're trying to do is find the areas where the water's coming out in the subsoil horizon. So maybe in between the B and the C horizon is a great place. But basically finding it, following it back to its source, right as it comes out of the earth, clean as possible, and then making this area where it flows steadily out on a smooth line, not over digging. This is a very delicate thing that m for the most part you're really only doing with hand tools because it's very easy to mess these places up and really cause yourself a lot of uh, problems. And this is a really valuable resource to be used but not squandered and not abused. And so it's something I take very seriously. 
you're following it back to right where it's coming out of those B and C horizons, making a nice, just barely sloped ditch so that you can get a good idea of flow rate. And then what you're actually making with that ditch is the area that you're going to set the pipe. And so what you do next is you take a pipe with that has perforations <coughs> in the top two thirds and not in the bottom third so that that water is can infiltrate the pipe and then flow out the bottom here. Then you're making a rock and clay dam at the downhill side of that so that that water is all entering the pipe. And then what you're doing is filling that all with washed round gravel. And in Ecuador, washed round gravel is not something you can buy at a store. Um, so the people that were helping me with the project had a lot of fun sorting a lot of <laughs> gravel in the river. Um, but very important that it is washed because otherwise you're going to get sand and sediment clogging up not just this pipe, but more importantly, the line leading to all your different tanks and things like that. And you're still, I'll show you guys, you still build in some sediment traps and things like that. But if you don't do this part right, you're just creating more work for yourself than you really need. So filling this all up with gravel and then eventually, uh, here's uh, my brother and Drew, two of the people that came down to do this project with us, washing gravel by hand in the river. It was quite a process to get the gravel to the spring sites because first they had to, and we figured out, I think they did about 10 tons of gravel between the three different springs. So first they had to wash it in the river, load it into a small dump truck, drive it up to the home site, take it out of the dump truck and put it in sacks, load it up on the donkey, get it up to the spring site, take it off of the donkey, make piles there, and then actually putting it into the springs when it came time to tap them. Uh, so I'm very appreciative of them and all the work and the baby smooth hands they had from washing <laughs> gravel in the river for so many days. It's like a spa. If anyone wants a spa treatment, I can put you to work down in Ecuador. Um, but basically this was a really interesting spring where actually we were casing a spring dug by a crab. And so this is actually a technique that they use in Ecuador. These crabs actually hunt for the water and they can smell the water and the different veins and they'll actually dig channels down to where the water's flowing in spring lines and basically pop open a hole so that the, it starts coming out and they're creating habitat for themselves. Um, and so it was really fascinating and you know, you can see I could stick my whole arm into this crab hole that was, you know, when you, when you find a spring, there's a layer that's permeable that is flowing through. It's a sand layer, it's a gravel layer, it's a silt layer. There's some material in there. This was just a void into the clay. So I was really wondering, what the hell is this? What created this? How did this form? I had no idea. And fortunately, we had the Ecuadorians with us. They were saying, oh, this is a spring that the crabs dug. We do this all the time. And so it, there it comes back to that really important local knowledge where I was wondering, okay, is this still good to tap for drinking water, all these different things? And so I was asking them and they were saying, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Drinking water is really high quality. And we, yeah, they basically do this to find springs on land sometimes is they'll bring these crabs in and release them, hoping to find them. And so I thought that was a really interesting way of partnering with nature. And sure enough, I started pulling out crab bits um, and all the moltings and things like that. And so here is actually laying the pipe, then the gravel, and then that clay on top of it. And so this is a really simple, a lot of times people will do geotextile on top of that gravel to keep any infiltration. <coughs> it kind of depends on the material you're covering it back up with and how much gravel you have. And I presented both options to these people and they wanted the more natural approach, even if they were gonna have to maybe come in at some point later and do something about it. Um, so we did this and a lot of spring tappings for a really long time did not involve geotextile fabric as well. And so this is really important because you've got the different horizons of the soil, you're harvesting the water where it's coming out clean from the earth, then you're closing this all back up with clay uh, so that, do I have a better, no. Um, so that basically an animal can come and die on top of this spring. It can defecate on top of the spring. It can do whatever. And none of that is contaminating your drinking water. It's not like the older spring casings where there's all sorts of frogs and dead frogs and all sorts of things in the water that you have no idea. 
this is a traditional way of spring casing, but it's a way that really ensures the highest quality of the water because you're harvesting it right out of the earth and you're sealing all of the rain and everything else from entering into the casing. Happy group of people, client drinking the water for the first time. These are the crabs, uh, which we found later on. This is a little baby one. They use bigger ones when they're actually hunting for water. Um, and so, you know, then once you start partnering with nature, you get all these beautiful elements just coming into place that provide all sorts of things that you could have never imagined. Uh, this is that river down at the bottom. So then I want to bring it back to the first time I worked with Sep, the first time I met Sep, which was in Montana, about an hour northeast of here in Dayton, a s place called Place of Gathering. And so this is the site. Now keep in mind, this is a satellite and the next image is going to be an aerial. But this was the property that we were working on coming up like this. This is a little double wide. Uh, this is this little boggy wetland, boggy wetland. This that used to be a nice bigger wetland, someone at some point decided they wanted an airstrip there. So they imported a bunch of gravel and just tried to fill in the wetland. And so the homeowner brought Sep out to see what she could do about repairing this. And so over 11 days, we created this uh, two and a half acre lake and a couple of different ponds, a kilometer of hula culture. Um, and so if you think, you know, there's the little water that was, that went dry every year in this, and then this degraded airway, and then this is what it was turned into. Um, this was the time of my life. I had just learned about SEP about a month before this event, and how I got my foot in the door. You know, the homeowner really had no idea the scope of things that was about to be undertaken. So we had no plants, no seeds. You know, she had a little, like, two-ton excavator when he arrived. By the time we ended, we had two 40-ton excavators, three dump trucks, two bulldozers, two 20-ton excavators, another 10-ton excavator. And so the scope grew out of what she was imagining very quickly. Um, and she had a neighbor who had this beautiful forest garden. He didn't call it such, but it basically was that. Th and he offered up plants. He kind of recognized that this was something ecological and interesting happening. And he said, yeah, come down and dig up plants and you can just have them. And so no one was moving on it. So I went to the homeowner and I said, hey, I'll wake up at 6 a.m. and I'll go up and dig up plants so that we have stuff to plant in these acres of earthworks that we're creating. So really just by taking the initiative and I just started working very hard from sunup to sundown. If you want to impress a farmer, just work harder than everyone else. It's really not that hard. Uh, and so that started getting recognized. I started getting invited to dinner and that's how this all steamrolled into an eventual apprenticeship with SEP. Just continuing to show up, continuing to have motivation and continuing to work hard. Um, and so uh, this was just incredible and I think it was incredible for so many different people. This is the first time I met Paul, um, a connection where, a place where a lot of different connections were made and really all these people were just so awestruck by how much of a positive impact we were creating in such a short amount of time. When you think to do something like that in 11 days is, is pretty wild. Uh, this is a picture of Zep showing us all how to plant stuff. And you know, a lot of people that haven't planted a lot, I'm sure you guys have, but you don't realize that you really need to put the plant in with a lot of force to make sure that there's not air pockets around. And if there are, it's gonna settle weird, it's gonna die, all these different issues. And so what he would say, which I think is a good way to remember it, is he's gonna come around after you and he's gonna test. And if he can pull out the plant, he's pulling it out and whacking you in the face with the roots of it. <laughs> and so everyone made sure that their plants were planted nice and steady. And so this is an aerial view of that hugel culture area, uh, the first couple of ponds, feeding down into the larger pond and just before and after to give you guys an idea. So this is satellite imagery because no one had any idea this was really going to take place until it did. And then this was that first summer. Uh, this is same, that first summer. Yep. So we did the project in May and I think these were like around August or July. Uh, these were these were trees that were there. So we were actually ripping out a bunch of trees and it's, you know, keep in mind that this is a satellite photo. So all these trees were there. It's just hard to see because it's a satellite image, not an aerial. 
And also there's the color differences. But what I really want you to be keen on is how much water area and water retention was made in really short order. Is that subsurface water that filled those this is kind of this wetland system. There's subsurface and surface flow. Um, we hit a couple of deep springs coming from the mountainside as we dug this one. And then there's also this wetlands flowing in through here. Um, is that through here. The, part of the old path on the other side? Is it? That tree line wandering down to the lake? The, which, this? Yeah, the other what branch, so both of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, so this actually, there's actually there's this big gully up here, and one leg of it comes off and through here, and then the other leg of it, the actual bigger leg of it, comes down and through there. So the lake is lower. Yeah. This is Flathead Lake. Yeah. yeah, and it's lower than this. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yep. 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 Okay. This is all flowing that way. Okay. Um, so, any other questions on this project before I just kind of bring it all full circle? Just, what's roughly what's the depth on these water features? These ones are a lot shallower, um, you know, maybe getting this one maybe gets as deep as three meters, 10 feet, um, somewhere around there. This one, probably 20 feet. I'm not positive about that, but something kind of in that neck of the woods. What kinds of things do they grow on? Um, you know, this was, this is one of those situations where, and this actually brings up a good question as far as, you know, when you're creating a disturbance, you're creating an opportunity in time when you can leverage and nudge the ecosystem in a certain direction. And so I think it's really important to not create more earthworks than you're actually able to work with and establish afterwards. Um, and so this was a situation, they grew lots of stuff on them the first couple of years but they've kind of gotten untended and wild because they were focused on developing other infrastructure and there's really just one person working on the ecology and they got tied up building for a couple of years um, but they grew lots of different things but this was definitely one of the cases where the scale of the work exceeded the ability or the quantity of the management after the management potential afterwards and so it it didn't quite, you know, it's a very productive landscape in an ecological sense where you can go there and see tracks of every speck of wildlife in Montana all in the same area. Everything's going through there. There's turtles, there's waterfowl. It's incredibly productive, but in a food sense, um, they produce some stuff for market the first couple of years, but it, you know, I think they not through any fault of their own, just because of the scale and things like that, they really missed that opportunity in time to really leverage the ecosystem in a certain direction. Um, and so now it's, um, it's a pretty wild system at this point. And so they were okay with it growing from their small vision to begin with? Well, their original budget or itself? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, you know, I forget how Katarina puts it, but, you know, it's like... She she really thought he would kind of make a little meditation garden and things like that. And what he did so wildly exceeded her craziest imagination. She asked Sep to restore the wetland, and that he did. There are turtles breeding there, and uh, it's, it's an incredible place ecologically. Um, but it takes a special person to take that leap as well. Someone with civil courage as well, um, for the reason you just stated. And so that's um, not something to be looked lightly upon. What is, is that the total budget for the whole project was 60000 I believe that was just the earth moving bill. And I'm not, that's, that's a rough scope. I don't, I don't know what the actual figure is. At one point I did, but um, that's just kind of a rough ballpark figure. So just to kind of bring it full circle, because people like to, people like repetition in uh, Western education. You know, nature is truth. Nature is the unifying truth that binds us all together. Water is life. It's the ultimate capital for any farm or any homestead or any living system. Interconnectedness is positively correlated with productivity. So the more connections you can build into an ecosystem, the more net pro productivity you're going to get out of it at the end of the day. And fear is the worst companion in life. Make fear your bitch and don't let it control you. Uh, things to cultivate within yourself, 
your relationship with nature, really build your awareness, really build your empathy, and look for the positive, beautiful things happening all around you. One of my favorite times with Sep was a time when we were just walking through his property and then all of a sudden he goes, oh! and runs over to this grape leaf and he <laughs> saw a butterfly. He had never seen that type before. And so he got everyone really quiet and he's saying how he needs to figure out what this butterfly is and why it's just showing up now and why he hasn't seen it before. And, you know, you want to always, it's a childlike enthusiasm that you never want to lose if you really want to partner with nature. Developing your mind, you know, learning things for yourself, practice-based experiential learning. Don't let theory hinder you. Don't get stuck in analysis paralysis. Do something and something happens. Make small experiments, make small failures, revel in those failures, learn from them, and then replicate the things that work really well from them. You apply the knowledge that you're learning from your different failures. Forethink, think ahead, and let time and nature always be working to your benefit. If you can do that, you're gonna be better off than most farmers the whole world over. And then landscape literacy. I would really you know, take the time to look around and start to see the things that have happened on landscape and the different effects that that's created long term. And then manifesting your world, you know, have that civil courage. Break those laws or conceptions or the, you know, sometimes it's even just perceptions that people think you're crazy. Who cares? Go ahead and do it and eventually they're going to want to try and copy you if it's successful. Freedom from attachment. Don't get so focused on, you know, I want to be the best pig breeder that you totally miss you know, maybe Highland cattle are the best thing for your land. Don't pencil yourself into any one thing. You know, it's, you can't predict it, so you can't put all your effort into one direction. And then relentlessness is a really important piece of the puzzle. You got to just know that what you're doing is what you really believe and hold true in your heart. And if you have that, you're going to be able to conquer anything that gets in your way. And so this guy, I, you know, I got to say thank you again for him. He's just He's opened up my world and he's blown my mind in so many different ways and it's really upon his shoulders that I'm able to do all of this work that I get to do now. Um, and he uh, fairly recently, about almost a year ago now, no, two years ago now, made me the first uh, Holzer certified practitioner that's kind of a special thing outside of his normal training program. And so I really take that on with a lot of responsibility and feel like, uh, you know, I've got to do a good job of building upon his legacy because he created this beautiful body of work. He created this approach that's so necessary and so important. And visiting that place in the Extremadura, he has a lot of beautiful projects, but that one was just jaw dropping. And to see that it can be done in that kind of climate that's so harsh, just it proved to me how important, how relevant, how simple and how necessary this work is. Um, and so I just want to say, you know, I used to be looking for hope. If you learn a lot about the world, you can get pretty downtrodden about all the different problems. And I'm at this point now where it's beyond hope. I know this is the type of land management that will take place in the future. It's more just a matter of how quick that transition is going to happen. And so that shift in momentum is the biggest change we can create. And I think all we're really working towards is just moving that ball forward so that this can take place sooner. Because it's what's worked for thousands of years and it's what will be working in the future. Um, it's just a matter of how bad things get before people start moving in this direction. That's my talk. If you like this sort of thing, come on out to the forums at permies.com, where we talk about the book of nature, homesteading, and permaculture all the time.
got your eyes and a pure soul within you there are no lies except the ones that we've told together I lose my way I 